so thank you. Um, my first question um, I would like to direct to Xavier and Pedro. Um, because it was something that, that um, I noticed, this uh, kind of resonance, um, and I would like you to both in dialogue um, elaborate on that resonance, is um, both of your presentations dealt with memory in a way for me. Um, the one m remembering the home during and after the travel and with you was the other way around. Um, how for you both do they resonate, resemblance each other or differ from each other in how that mechanism function of remembering something where you are not? Um. In the case of my, um, in the case of the, the the story that I was telling about the, um, both being the the colonial soldiers or the soldiers for the matter being asked to 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 retell the story a biblical story of um, of the the son that returns home, uh, but more more specifically of the refugees and asylum seekers having to describe pictures that depict like a family um, having a meal at home kind of work out memory in a different manner because I think, I, I speculate and I suppose that the idea is to elicit certain certain truth from an accent, from that uh, memory of home. So it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's again, it's reestablishing your sounding self as in that moment becoming, again, your history. So in that sense, I think, Evoking memory is kind of a tricky thing in that situ in that specific situation, right? Especially because, and and that is is really interesting because when I, for instance, when I was doing the rehearsals for the CTM piece, um, two of my singers, by the way, they are asylum asylum seekers themselves. I mean, now they are um, officially refugees, but they they went through this process. And when I told them the story of the the, the picture, because they didn't went they didn't go through this process. Um, uh, Leon, one of the singers, he told me that's torture. To being to have to remember to look at a picture and to have this memory of a family having you at home when home doesn't exist anymore is a form of torture. So in that case, memory just just is instrumental. It's just weaponized against against yourself, done so through sound. In 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 the way that I'm speaking in this specific work about <laughs> memory, that's how I would see it. Yeah. <coughs> mm. There's another level, very interesting also, and, and it's related also to uh, speak a, a minor language. And, and it was very interesting uh, in Pepe's lecture to, to see like all the, these things about dialects, you know, and how there's more mainly is the sounding, how, how you sound, and how this is related to geography also. And in the case of the ox cart, there's something uh, really funny, more funny. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was when I was researching, I was uh, it was very difficult to to understand why they were doing at first, uh, it, because on the only information you have is based on this old text, all there uh, written by uh, foreigners, tourists. Not it doesn't exist un until the uh, 30s. Uh, any uh, text uh, written in Basque or in Spanish talking about this sound, um, specifically about this sound, except some brief uh, uh, mention in Don Quixote by Cervantes. Um, so uh, th this part of knowing, okay, w w why they are doing this? Uh, you hear that this this uh, sound. I mean, it's not something that. Okay, it's just because they don't grease the wheels and <laughs> it's something that <laughs> something more. I mean, it sounds like Tony Conrad's early minis minimalism or anything <laughs> like that. So it's just uh, uh, something. Like that. And the other, the second question was why this disappeared. No? And one of the, the the answer for the first uh, question was that it's part of this letter that any every house has its own sound. They could recognize each other. So th this sound became like uh, your name. Let's say, especially in a geographical uh, uh, situation where uh, surrounded by mountains, and so you, you cannot see very well who is coming from the other side of the road. You know? And uh, there were there were even some rules. The one that was waiting for the other ox cart have to give some tobacco to to the one who was coming. You know, and this kind of stuff. And 
but uh, so once uh, I, I found that this was uh, not uh, something uh, a mistake, let's say, or failure or of a, a technology or ancient technology. Um, the main question is that was that okay, why it disappeared? And uh, the way of, uh, there's I, it's very difficult to know uh, exactly why. For instance, in Brazil, where these recordings were made, is the only place where you can find, not in a usual day, but uh, during some uh, um, meetings or, or uh, processions, etc., um, it disappeared uh, yeah, around 30, something like that, uh, 1930s, and then it came back during World War II because there was not uh, uh, there was a strong cut on you know, on fuel and gasoil in all the country, so some people started to to bring back the, the ox carts. Uh, but in Spain, uh, uh, what happened was that during the dictatorship, especially uh, the priests who were really somehow um, controlling a part of the system to control the society, uh, they uh, learned to identify the sounds of the ox carts. So, uh, you know, um, I don't know, uh, some of you know, but, but at least in, in Spain, uh, it was this tradition that 12 at noon, you had to stop working uh, to pray. That was called the Angelus. And if someone was not stopping to, uh, to pray, the priest who could recognize who was doing, who was uh, uh, working. And then on Sunday, in, in the main uh, mass, he was saying, okay, you are the <laughs> sinner that was not stopping. So somehow people start to quiet, to, to silence the, the, their own ox carts. No? Somehow this is related to biometrics. <laughs> 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 and, and a good dose of Christian guilt, yeah. right? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then I have a, a question that I first want to address to David, but where you, of course, can uh, so join uh, the answer or the discussion, is that in a certain way, you all three work with assemblages of others, with excerpts of texts of others. And what does it mean for you to speak through, in a certain way, listening and reading others? Well... Pedro talked about this um, process of uh, colonizers arriving um, and I think you said try to make sense um, of what they encountered by imposing um, certain frameworks on um, very unfamiliar scenes and events. And I think as you get older and you work in this area of arts and humanities and intellectual inquiry and so on, you realize that you're, you're kind of the colonizer of yourself. In other, words, you're, in other words, you're constantly having to make sense of yourself. And um, I'm very interested in the fragments, if you like. Mm. So... This notion of assemblage um, is important to me in the sense that um, it makes something that um, comes together as a single cluster of events, but at the same time, um, it's nothing really to do with coherence. Um, the coherence is a um, maybe an ongoing process of, and uh, you know, in a way that one of the things you do when you write a book or a paper or an essay is to take all of these elements and to take the essence of you of them, if you like, and, and mold them and and fight with them to make something that sort of makes sense <laughs> um, and as I get older I realize you know the pressure is more and more to do that and out of um, trying to stay true to myself maybe I resist that mm. you know and so um, it's maybe more interesting to me now to to just work with these 
fragments of texts and sounds and people I meet, the recordings of that, the objects I make, all of those separate elements to keep them somewhat separate, but they come together in one place at one time. Um, is it about suggesting something instead of stating something? And <laughs> leaving space for you, but also for the other? Like you also mentioned that in a certain way, that it is about to leaving space for the other and not stating that is other. Has it to do with something with that, or is it that completely? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th yeah, definitely, I think so. Um, yeah, of, of course, there's suggestion um, from choice of texts and choice of elements. Um, but I suppose it's, you know, I was talking about this problem I have with a lecture, and a lecture implies authority. And, it, you know, I have, I guess I've always had problems with that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can, be, you can get seduced into these forms um, or forced into them, more or less. If, if you work in the academic environment, then you're compelled, more or less, to, to work in these forms. And um, so you go through that and it causes pain and you know, discomfort, um, and you either uh, come to accept it or you fight against it. And uh, I mean, in a way, I have no reason to do any of these things anymore, <laughs> other than personal need, you know? So I sort of feel I can do what I want with them. But uh, I also think it's true that, uh, you know, pick up people pick up what they want. Uh, I mean, it's very true. If I give a musical performance, then from time to time people will come up to me and say, this is what I heard, and they have a narrative, you know. Um, and I say, yeah, that's great. You know, it's got nothing to do with <laughs> my idea what, what was going on, but that's absolutely fine. You know, and I, I think it's the same with books or, you know, if you give a lecture or anything else, that people go away with totally their own impression of what you were talking about. Um, and that's absolutely fine. I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, I, mean, I would just follow a little bit. I mean, I think it's related somehow to desire in the sense that uh, when you read something on, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in... in um, and your book about resonance, you know, how when you watch a painting, when you read a text uh, written a few centuries before, and, and you try to catch somehow, you try to listen, you try to, to, to probably even to understand <laughs> automatically what is happening on this image or this text. Um, but this level of suggestion uh, is, is very, very strong. And in that sense, I, it's it's uh, related, and that had, that was the feeling I had when listening to to David. Uh, uh, it was very close to a concert in that sense. When when you compose music, or no, and even if you're not conscious, you are always <coughs> quoting things you have learned, heard, or whatever, and you include it somehow. And sometimes you have to fight against that. You don't agree at all, but there's something that is pushing you to use it. No? And and so in that sense, it was very beautiful to to understand your lecture as concert. For me, it was total concert, absolutely concert. I mean, it was just a, a, and I don't know. A, it could be a, a, um, more musical in some senses, in the sense that if you use different voices or if you change your your your, your accent when reading one text or the other, no, you can really. But in any case, it was a concert, and uh, I have the desire to listen to him to don't understand English, to be honest, uh, to see what happens, how, what, what, what would change in, in, uh, to me when listening to that. You know? So in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's strongly related to, to, to the one, one kind of desire. It's, it, 
sorry if I could continue with that, but yeah, yeah the d the desire part is is extremely important because you have the desire to make something out of what w what we call research. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Santiago de Compostela and. Xavier and I were having lunch, and he was telling me about the ox carts, and it was incredibly exciting to hear this. Uh, I think we we're in a very noisy restaurant, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I wanted to hear the ox carts because I thought this is something I've never heard, and I want to hear it. And then I was in California last autumn, and I was reading this Western novel by Owen Wister. The Virginian, and I suddenly came across this passage, which I read, and I immediately thought of you because I thought these are doing the making the same sound, and here we are in fiction, having this description of a, of a of an instrument that may or mon may not have existed. I don't know whether he completely invented this contraption, you know, for making a terrible noise, but whether he did or not. It Maybe it came, I mean, they used to use ox carts in America, mm -hmm. you know, with the wagon trains going to the west. So, and, um, you know, maybe there were Basque people in the wagon trains, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, maybe this strange passage, which is highly suggestive of a kind of music that you desperately want to hear, uh, maybe because you've never heard it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, you know, so these strange links happen uh, across this uh, kind of fragmented practice. And then before we open up, there was one other thing that for me linked the three of you, and that's what you call the problem of to name something. I think with you, Pedro, it's also very present, the, the thing to name, to label things. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more and if for you if that is linked to how we are often as children l are learned to listen to the source or to search for the source in our listening. That's 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 quite interesting because um the idea of 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 learning how to label or relying too much on on having to label things is is one of these desires to make sense in us uh, of that is in the in the root of the colonial endeavor in a sense that it replaces that was there before. So when when David was was um, doing his lecture, that uh, you talked about the fluidity instead of a taxonomy, and that is precisely what taxonomy seeks to replace. Taxonomy seeks to replace fluidity. It seeks to replace the fact that things are interconnected beyond um, beyond our common under our our regular understandings of it. So. And that, for me, is, is quite interesting when I try to approach the idea of, of what is there in an accent that can be <laughs> used, instrumentalized, to justify certain decisions, right? Like, so this, this fictional categories that you just pull from a pool of, um, of really blurry, blurry things, things that, that, that intersect one another, things that are part of the same relational uh, um, environment, and then just pinpoint one and say, like, this is determining whether or not you are your true sounding self. So that sense of labeling things um, and the violence, that the, the sort of epistemic violence that it does, I think, I think is is one of the things that uh, uh, biometric technologies are doing that is more, more most dangerous, for instance, and also, of course, relates to how how that translates to sound, and especially not, not not so much to sound, but how we listen, right? Like because sounds, sounds are sounds essentially. So it's how how we make sense of those sounds is what matters. There's a uh, there's a great story about Humboldt. Uh, you both mentioned him, so I'm going to mention him as well. Ah yes, 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 Humboldt was very interested in electric eels. And when he was in, I think, Venezuela, he did this experiment where he drove horses into a river where he knew there were electric eels. And um, as the horses were shocked by the electric eels, they were screaming in pain and fear. And um, in a way, this is a little bit like the ox carts. You know, it's a kind of proto-noise music. Mm -hmm. 
You, you know, it's a kind of vernacular noise music. But uh, in a way, it contains the seeds of, of two different um, strategies. Um, one is towards the wildness of electricity, you know, which leads us to something like electronic music. And the other way is towards taxonomy and science and, you know, the electrical grid and, you know, regulation and, and, and so on. And I, I think that story is, is, is very nice, you know. It, it has in it, you know, both chaos <laughs> and also, you know, this drive towards order. Thank you. Is there anyone up for first question in the audience? a question for Pedro because um, um, when you showed the the forms that uh, you would get after the interview there was a score there and I'm just wondering how the score was created for example what would be the ideal accent that would get a hundred percent because normally in like the kind of databases that I've worked on for like citizen data that you get the the maximum, it's not a real thing that you get. It's constructed from your like digital neighbors yeah. for something that is like kind of an agglomeration of everyone that is like you. So I was just wondering if it's like a constructed ideal, 100% that like no one would ever get it. Um, the short answer to this is I have no clue. Because we are talking about like black boxed uh, software that is bought by a government, right? Um, what I do know is what was um, asked because they have uh, in Germany they have this Freedom of Information Act. Uh, what, what was asked by a group of activists, and that where I got some of those informations from. Um, that it's interesting. It's interesting how they they mention that they use these databases that are based on phone calls, right? So. And if we think about phone calls, they already cut off many frequencies of sound. Like the device of the telephone already filters off so many frequencies of the voice that to think that a, a telephone call is in any way an accurate representation of a voice is already weird to think about. But when you think about how this process is worked, and I have no training on, on computer science to be able to explain that, but <laughs> essentially, what, it, what an accent recognition does is that it transforms, it, it takes uh, power coefficients from those sounds and matches it to a physical modeling of the vocal tract of that person's accent or something like that. So I wonder whether or not it is possible to achieve 100% given that the error margin was already at the beginning very large, like 20% is a lot, right? And this log likely root ratio for me, I mean, most of those things that, that are on the, um, I don't know the name of that in English, uh, it's an actin in German, yeah. Um, but the, the, the formula that you get, um, most of them for me, they sound complete gibberish. There is a gender score there. I don't know if it was visible in the way. So there was a, what does that even mean? Because it was in the, in the, in the thing was minus one. So what does that mean, you know? <laughs> so, and also there is something, you know, so all those things that I think, Okay, let, let me try to rephrase this. I think the question is less whether or not it is possible to be accurate, but instead whether or not doing the testing in the first place is, is likely to yield any possible trust, trustworthy result, right? Um, there was another detail in that file that I got that the official policy for the, the German migration authorities is that you have to have at least two minutes of usable speech for the software to actually work. And if you see the, the, the formula that I, the, the form that I've shown, you have only 25 seconds of speech in that. So, you know, all those things, they, they sum up to being completely inaccurate. So it becomes almost like wishful thinking or kind of bringing back the cage quote that I said, like it's only measuring, measuring means, you know, they want to find something there and they will find something there. Whether or not it's accurate, it's completely irre irrelevant when it becomes 
our a way to say no, you know. So yeah, I hope it sort of answers. Wow, where? <laughs> in Spain. So I'm not so old. I mean, but where? <laughs> where in Spain? I'm, I'm going tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. It's is close. Yeah. But ha how long ago? How come? Well, I was born in the 60s. Yeah. And then I was going to every summer on holidays to Burgos for Madrid. Mm -hmm. My family, because I was born there. So until 75 at least, they were always there. Mm -hmm. But s s several? Yeah, there were two. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's a lot. Uh, that's a lot yeah. I mean, uh, uh, part of the research, I, I, they invite me to Portugal to, to find one because I, I, I was even in Burgos, someone told me about uh, that, but I couldn't find it. In fact, it's very difficult to trace. It's just what, what do you go to a mountain and wait for? <laughs> yeah. no, 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 but. The, the, the yeah, 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 but, but like, I mean, uh, uh, cards uh, like this, you can find a lot, but the other, the, uh, the other problem is how to move it. Yeah. The oxys, uh, the oxys yeah, but I yeah, I have two oxys at home. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not about the cards, it's not about the oxys. Yeah, the problem is the oxys. It's true, it's true, it's true. This is why on the, w on, on the, on, in Galicia, they used to, they used uh, cows. Yeah, because it's at least cows can can uh, give birth uh, new animals. I mean, it, but the the ox is, is very very expensive. That's true, and uh, still. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, but this is why, this f from Orpheus, I mean, it's the animals like music, no? And so, so this is why we put uh, a lot of or bells or whatever to uh, different animals. Some of them are wilder, some of them are not. No. But I, I want to, to, to tell this, like, uh, when I went to Portugal and and I, they they, uh, they told me, okay, uh, we found one guy here with an ox cart, and he's, he's, uh, he uses the ox cart to work. And I went there, and I spent like four days uh, at home speaking. He was telling me a lot of incredible stories about that. Wow, wow. And, and Fernando was, and, and uh, there were like two things I would like to mention. One is, uh, but why do you still use uh, ox cart, Fernando? And he said, yeah, you know, when I came back from from Angola war in the 60s, uh, uh, and uh, I took I, I bought a, a tractor, but I didn't have the license to. And then one day the police uh, uh, take me, and and I have to pay a big penalty. So I, I decided to don't drive a, a tractor anymore. That could be the case for Burgos uh, Oscar driver. It could be. It could be. I'm saying, yeah. 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 So it's just a question, no? <laughs> and then uh, the, the second thing about this Portuguese uh, guy was that uh, at the very end I was asking him, like, uh, Fernando, wh when when can we record the, the auction? No, tomorrow, tomorrow. And tomorrow was raining, okay. And when I was going at home, at his home again. And then he was delaying, 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 delaying. I have to come back home. So I say, okay, Fernando, we, we have to make it right now. It's just, a, okay, tomorrow morning, okay. And then tomorrow morning, I prepare the card. I put like contact mics, everything, uh, a lot of different kind of microphones. It was the, my very first time that I had the chance to, and it was a real ox card. Wow, perfect. With cows, doesn't matter. Cows, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. And then uh, he said, "Okay, Fernando, let's go." And there was it's not was not 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 making any sound. No. It's like. Stop, 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 what happens? And then, ah, sorry, I forgot to tell you that uh, I changed the piece on the axle. <laughs> I put like <laughs> some <laughs> metal piece because, but why? Because neighbors, you know, I mean, they, they don't accept my noise. And uh, so, so, so sometimes, I mean, I, I was telling you how difficult, but how exciting it is also to make this kind of research, you know? So if you have the, the reference of where is exactly in Burgos, yeah, please, thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. Cards, yeah. yeah. The card, this is a very symbol of uh, a kind of Spain that is going on in, in Manolo's you know? So no, but this is this is another kind of card. Yeah, it's another kind of card, but it's also here for the No, the, there is a, an, the, the song, probably the most famous song about this, a part of this tremendous, which wrote the uh, anthem of Angola, and uh, he's taken this uh, poetry from uh, Solano Trindade, who is Brazilian, etc. But the most famous song is Atahualpa Yupanqui's Los Ejes de Mi Carreta. Exactly. But this is what happened. I mean, every time I talk publicly about this and then I use the song and suddenly it's like, everybody's like, ah, okay, now I know what he's talking about because nobody can understand exactly what, what this noise is talking about. It's exactly that it happens with the text. You know? and, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that there's the word instrumentalization is very problematic as well. I mean, that's something that is very familiar these days, particularly in the arts. You know, the art of one kind or another is so frequently instrumentalized uh, for a purpose. Um, and that, to me, goes against everything I believe in. Um, so, yeah, I think this word instrument is really problematic, and I think the relationship between... I mean, in fact, the instrument itself can be the slave. Um, y you can think about it in that way. So I suppose what I'm trying to do um, is rethink this relationship or rethink this idea of... of the so-called object of the instrument, you know, the so-called inanimate object. Um, and um, if you like, distribute the elements of the instrument to the point where there's no distinction anymore between animate and inanimate, um, or, or the I mean, there was a there was a passage I was going to read, um, which was from a book just about um, flutes in lowland Brazil, um, and it's it's about this idea of the breath, and um, 
in shamanistic practice, tobacco gives form to breath through smoke, and in the same way, the playing of a flute gives form to breath. So, in fact, there's no distinction to be made between um, what you could characterize as the master and the servant, or the operator and the instrument. You know, that they're really indivisible. And I prefer to think in, in that way. But in a way, taking on the idea of the instrument is deliberately addressing this problem that you're talking about. To, to try to do something with this word instrument, you know? I mean, I'm a, I'm a classic example of an art school musician. <laughs> um, you know, self-taught musician um, who was an art student and then became a writer. And so, y you know, within uh, I mean my whole ap approach to the instrument is very different to somebody who is, you know, who has been a professional musician from very young. Um, and so, I mean, Xavier mentioned this book I wrote, uh, Sinister Resonance, where I was talking about paintings as instruments. And so you move far further and further away from this, from Aristotle, I think, in that sense. Yeah, somebody, um, actually the daughter of somebody I know, um, she's studying at the moment and she was writing a, uh, an essay and she contacted me to ask me a question and she was asking about um, whether the objects we use in a performance have rights. You know, uh, if we think of of ob the objects we use as in some sense living beings or living entities, do they then have rights? So what then are the implications, um, say for my, the objects on my table, um, in terms of um, authorship of a performance? <laughs> and, um, I mean, I, I said to her, I think this is a, a problem which it helps to divide it in, in, into, on the one hand, the problem of copyright, which is deeply problematic and um, completely out of date, really, in, in terms of the way people work now. And then this other problem of, of um, objects as to some degree living entities, in other words, trying to find an equality so that y you're eroding this relationship of master and slave. I mean, it's, it's a strange, <laughs> you know, it's a strange area to move into, but I think it's, it's very important for future thinking. I don't have an answer. I mean, I think, you know, terminology, in a way, it's, to me, it's best to find words that are sort of red hot to the touch. You know, it's, it's no good finding words that have no resonance, no meaning to anybody, no, no, um, no danger to them, you know. 
Otherwise, we don't have these discussions. <laughs> I just want to pick into that um, with the theme we talked about this morning, which contrasts a bit on your reading of instrument, but does it also incorporate, do you also call it an instrument to incorporate the element of play? Sure, yeah, I think um, the concept of play is very important. Um, I like what Douglas, the things that Douglas Winnicott said about play, you know, and I think they're, they're extremely relevant to thinking about this. But, <coughs> yeah, you could, you could in fact call everything toys. Um, and I, I think there's a nice humility about calling everything toys, particularly in this kind of setting where, um, you know, we're all giving lectures. <laughs> and, and so to be making lectures with toys, I think, is nice. But toys doesn't quite do it for, for me, you know. So, I don't know. Thank you. Is there another question in the audience? And if you think that improvisation could be used as a tool to release some sort of internalized biases that, for example, uh, are accumulated through self-colonization. And, and if you think that, I, I don't know, I have the impression that in varied current artistic practices, I have. I have, th have the impression that there's a tendency of skipping the the part where you have first of all to accept all that is internalized and to go immediately to the second part, which is like, let's fight against it, but how can you, you know, like uh, solve the problem if you haven't really uh, accepted that you have it. Mm. So to use yeah, maybe rationally you know that you have it, but one thing is to know it rationally and one thing is to digest it. And if, so if improvisation could be a tool to let things emerge out of a state of false duration and repetition, and yeah, and if. Yeah, I, th I think many people think of improvisation in exactly that way that it, it's a kind of opening of the conduits. You, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a release mechanism for internalized material. Um, and I, I think that's a kind of problematic um, way of thinking about it. It's something I talk about with students a lot. You know, what is improvisation? And, and they say, well, yeah, it's a kind of freedom, you know, to do what you like. And, and then we play, and uh, it's anything but a freedom to do what we like. It's, y you know, it's, it's very often stuck in one place and, and um, inhibited and um, stereotypical. And, um, it, you know, but that's a beginning point to really examine these these kind of questions and you know and I know many improvisers who I would say um, are perfect examples of people who colonize themselves you know they create a kind of brand of what they do which is highly recognizable and um, you know in that sense very useful in career terms and so my question is always how how to work against that, you know. And I think as you go through life, you move through many different strategies of some of which work for a bit, and some of which don't work at all, and some of which are almost, they work so well that they're catastrophic, <laughs> you know, at a personal level. But um, 
you know, there's never a point when you can say, I stopped this, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay where I am now, because in fact the process of colonization, I realize as I get older, I, I made this point earlier, but the process of colonization becomes more and more marked as, you know, as the years go on. Because in a way you get to know your material better. Um, you're under pressure, I suppose, as you get older to um, produce some kind of synthesis. You know, it's like a cliche of the old person who's synthesized all their knowledge, you know, into a kind of theory of everything, which is a kind of nonsense, really. Um, I think improvisa you, you can use improvisation to destabilize yourself, to subvert yourself. Um, but you have to be conscious about it all the time. One way I do that is to always use a different setup, um, w you know, working in different situations. Or I try and do things where I forget things, you know. Um, I don't know whether things are going to work. Um, I went through a period of doing lectures where I would not prepare anything and I would just sort of stand or sit and kind of <coughs> face people and have to do something. And I, you know, for a time I, I tried not doing an anything at all, but I never really had the courage to do nothing. I think y to give a lecture in which you did nothing would be fantastic, but I've never managed to do that. Um, but it would be amazing, you know. There, I mean, th there were passages in Shabby's talk where he didn't say anything, and you thought, oh, maybe something's not working. And then, yeah, you start to think, okay, I, I get what's going on here. This is good. This is interesting, you know. And um, but very quickly, these things become tricks. <coughs> you know, that's a human thing, isn't it? We we really, in some ways, we c we're unknowable to ourselves, but in, uh, in other nasty ways, we get to know e ourselves very quickly. And so, you know, I think it's a constant process of cutting away at yourself, you know, to... And improvisation is, yeah, it can be very useful. But as long as we realize that it cannot do exactly the opposite, it can be a way of becoming a great hero of doing exactly the same thing over and over again and calling it improvisation. <laughs> you know? I think there's time for one last question. If somebody still has a question. Yes. Yeah, we have to accept a difference, right? We, uh, we all have, uh, I mean, everybody has something to say. And uh, we accept a difference when somebody makes a question, you know, and, and, and so, uh, I mean, this is a huge problem, it seems to me at the moment, of allowing, um, of allowing speaking without, um, without giving in to authority. You know, in a way, online trolling is, is a great example, you know, of silencing people. I, you know, if a woman says something, then th there are 10,000 rape threats, you know, immediately online to silence her. So uh, I think, uh, you know, this idea that people may have something to say is extremely important to us now. And in musical terms, yes, of course. You stand up on a stage and you say, 
I have skills, I have, uh, you know, I practice, I, I can do this stuff and I'm asserting my authority because I'm asking you to be totally quiet for the next 40 minutes or so. And, and to me the consciousness of what you're doing is, is the first step, you know, and to working on subverting it. I mean, I think that what we'll do on Sunday myself, Rie, and Aki, and Akio, is um, a consequence of having experienced in this experience in this area and, and discussing it a lot and playing with different possibilities. But I'm also interested to hear what you two think about this, you know, this lecture situation and standing up and I think it's related to what she was asking about the uh, free improv also, free improvisation. Um, in the sense that uh, everybody who has been practicing free improvisation have been uh, or witnessed or, or even playing in a situation where there was no stage, no? Uh, or we were trying to erase or delete the stage and uh, to see what happens. And then uh, sometimes, or sometimes, I, w I must say that almost always, uh, there's this kind of tension uh, with the audience because you, you, you start to understand that uh, whoever who comes to a concert needs a stage also, especially when it's paying. Uh, when you pay, uh, you need something, yeah, you know, when, mm, 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 a vanishing point, let's say. <laughs> this is for where you throw your money somehow, yeah, to this vanishing point. This vanishing point is a stage, obviously. If you, br if you break that rule, uh, the situation becomes very interesting, but uh, maybe more violent than you as player would <laughs> like to expect. Yeah. You know, it's like you come with a proposal which tries to, I don't know, uh, uh, question some kind of aesthetics of music, the dynamics, loudness, etc., 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 and then just Part of it is like this: this uh, question, questioning the, the stage, and then when you question the stage, uh, uh, it's like uh, all the rest doesn't matter much. It, it can happen, and not always. But uh, um, for, in my opinion, the most interesting thing is just to to be there, to to make it happen. Uh, there are some things that I, I can I can't avoid uh, uh, that people here needs to have on stage or not. Or needs to to. I'm going to a lecture which is in a cinema. We all, everybody knows how the cinema works, and this is like a a a, a, a room designed just for that. Uh, the cinema, I, I mean, it's even more than out the auditorium, because it's more comfortable. Uh, uh, ev the acoustic is much m better than most m a lot of auditoriums. <laughs> I must say. There are a lot of uh, speakers. Look at this. I mean, if you look from this side, it's like, wow, th this is a, a very powerful dispositive. Uh, now, the, w which are the chances I have to, 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 to break this, and which are the expectations that everybody who comes here? <coughs> Imagine that for a, mm, for a moment, when uh, at the very beginning, we could propose everybody, okay, why don't you sit here and we sit there? Uh, I don't know. If most of the people will stay for two hours being here. Even there are only three of us observing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I'm not saying that this is like something courageous, something like that to be here. No, no, absolutely not. It's just like but how we internalize, and this is related to this colonization, I think, also f not only from the, the practitioner of the, uh, the, the improviser, but by the audience also. And uh, so mm, I think there is no, and the beautiful thing probably is that there is no clear answer to that. It's just uh, uh, this kind of music, this kind of uh, proposal, this kind of festival also gives you a chance to experiment with that. Yeah, I started playing in the 1960s and it was very common in the early 70s for um, people to invade the stage. You know, I, I mean, I remember playing a concert in Bolzano in Italy, and uh, I was playing with a percussionist. Uh, and as soon as we started playing, within five minutes, the whole audience rioted and went completely crazy. <laughs> and 
the only thing we could do was continue because there was nowhere else to go. So we continued and at the end they applauded us for having the courage to continue. But in a way, these, this kind of, this idea that there should be no hierarchy at all, you know, that nobody can be any kind of an expert. Uh, well, in a sense, we've come back to those times now. You know, that there is no such thing as experts. Um, you know, so that led to a dead end. But I think the important thing is to continually question these relationships, these formats throughout your life, you know. And, and one of my feelings is that many of these formats are rather exhausted. So, um, you know, we should experiment with new ones. I think that's a good note to end today. We hope to see you all tonight at the concert and tomorrow morning for a new day with six new keynote speakers. Thank you.